Uh, well, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Ms. Sauri Dubourg, who is the member of the board of the executive directors of BASF, for her presentation. Thank you very much. Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to the GPCA. Um, I would like to contribute to the discussion by bringing an aspect to you that is linked to how to generate sustainable growth for the future, and I think it's very nicely linked to what the pre-speaker said. In order to get there, sustainability in the spotlight has arrived worldwide at the decision-making center at various levels. Not only a society that is challenging us increasingly globally, and the year 2019 has been unprecedented, also political decision makers are taking a strong stand and governments are increasingly tightening up rules and regulations. But also customer industries and also financial industry is actually piling up in an unprecedented way. Let me show you what we in BASF see and how we think about this topic because we are in the middle of a major transformation and the question that was asked this morning was rightfully positioned. How do we need to take this upcoming new wave of transformation in a positive, constructive way for our industry? Now, if you look at the EU, for example, 180 billion annual investment will be needed in order to comply with the Paris Climate Protocol. And this is just the beginning. Let me give you some insight why social challenges and social divide is increasing globally. When we looked at the GDP of the United States, you see a constant growth since 2002. But interestingly, household incomes have not grown in the same manner as in the GDP growth. So when we looked into where exactly did this happen, there were actually two states in the United States where this divide was most pronounced. One was California, where new WhatsApp founders, for example, gained billions for an excellent new business model. The participation in this income was limited to a few. So digitalization fostered tremendous new gains in scaling effects. However, also Wall Street, New York was the second state where this divide was most pronounced, shows that digitalization poses a question of how do we take people along. And this is, by the way, not only a pattern in the United States. You see that increasingly this divide, the social divide, questioning the trust in business, questioning the way we take people along is spreading globally and poses real challenges to the political landscape. This is why global leaders from China, now in the EU, as well as leaders in the financial industry like BlackRock are increasingly questioning how do we take this in a positive way constructively forward. While China is constantly building on green infrastructure and trying to finance more and more of these projects, the EU has just decided on a green deal that will come up with a legislation of CO2 reduction targets that are unprecedented, targeting legally for a zero CO2 environment by 2050. What this means for our industry, I think I will come to in a minute. But it's not only the political landscape, it's also customers that are increasingly asking for the performance of companies in terms of sustainability. In BSF alone, we had 247 requests how to deal with this topic. Let me show you what trends will come up in the next years and how fast they will come. We have asked 9,000 experts around the world who will see what kind of topics and by when. And you know, this is very, very interesting because it has a major question towards our industry. Because what it means, most of the sustainability trends will come earlier and faster and evolve completely to a full extent than we all think. So you see topics like noise reduction, lightweight, bio-based material, responsible sourcing, also recycling, unfolding quite rapidly. While this is a challenge, it's one of the biggest opportunity fields for our industry. And I think there are many solutions we can provide. What it requires is a very, very agile attitude towards change. By the way, the reason why electric vehicles is so late is there's really still discussions among experts by when this trend will be completely unfolded. 
Now let me go to the financial industry, and this is also dramatically shifting while I'm speaking. You know, in the last year, we had an economic loss that was weather-related for the banking sector of 117 billion euro. And this most likely is just the beginning. When you look at the global assets being conformative with the Paris Climate Protocol, according to the World Bank standard, there are stranded assets about 240 billion that are not climate protocol conform. Now, this is one of the reasons why even in the banking sector, in investment landscapes, we see a trend that specifically industry that is CO2 emitting is increasingly challenged as part of the portfolio. We believe this is extremely critical for our industry because we are part of a longer value chain and we are heavily needed to future uh, options in terms of renewable solutions and so on and so forth. So what if there is a blacklisting of a whole industry? I think the effect would be disastrous. And this is why we were thinking deeply, how do we have to position as a chemical industry to show that we can truly add value? And it's not a good idea just to focus on CO2 saving industries because we would have the world in terms of industries, which is probably not future oriented. Now, this morning, some of the excellent speakers spoke about the transformation we are in. And if I think about this on a wider picture, you can see that we are in the middle of a pattern change. We came from the age, all of us, from the age of globalization. We as BASF started investing in China in the 90s already. We are still working on, you know, including and expressing new footprints across the world. But why we all do so, there is a new S-curve evolving. And this pattern change this time is fundamentally different. While the globalization was driven by volume growth, the new wave at the center core has smart resource usage in all factors at the center stage. And interestingly, this will evolve multiple ways of innovation on the technology side, research side, but also business model-wise, because it's no longer just about volume growth. In many businesses, we see a transformation towards value growth. If you just think about, for example, the agricultural industry, whereby less is more is a huge paradigm shift. Putting less chemicals on the ground is a major industry challenge while still earning money with it. And this is just the beginning. But it also has beautiful opportunities for our industries if we know how to take it. This is a true paradigm shift we have to prepare for. And by the way, there's one element in the resource usage that is very close to the petrochemical industry. At its core, sustainability is nothing else than a new level of efficiency. Being efficient with everything we do. Now, there's one element as an industry which will be so fundamentally important, especially while political frameworks are changing. And this is why today I would not only like to speak about the chances of sustainability, I also would like to speak about the limits. And I will tell you why. Here's an example of the CO2 landscape of BSF Group. We have reduced the CO2 footprint since 1990 by almost 50%. Today we emit 22 million tons globally. As a company, we have never spoken about it, we just did it. Maybe it's because we are more science-based than marketing-oriented. However, what it literally means, and this is a picture that now affects a lot of chemical players in the market, just reducing the CO2 level by half, which is required at the moment in one of the new suggestions of the Green Deal by 2030, is technically not possible for a lot of players. And here comes the limits of technology. I think it's time for our industry to enter a serious dialogue with politicians. What is doable, how we can contribute positively, and where the limits are. We have seen in Germany specifically, if we don't speak up, what happens to an entire industry. If you look at the automotive industry in Germany, we haven't spoken up about technical limits. 
politicians came up with targets far beyond technical capabilities. As an end result, a whole industry became a trust issue and politicians as well. So if we want to build credible systems and transformations, I think what it is needed, and that's my first point on collaboration, there's a new wave of collaboration and dialogue needed between politics and industry, how to make this transformation constructively work. There is certainly research going on how to change the CO2 footprint of companies in many chemical players at this point in time, but this is a game on time, and we need to talk about this. Second, how do we deal with sustainable product needs from customers? In BSF, we have around about 60,000 products, and we have looked at what, what contribution do we have technology-wise on sustainability. But I can tell you we are right now at 15 billion euros net sales with sustainable products. We call them accelerators. These are products that have a unique competitive advantage on sustainability. They go from content in better materials to you know, isolation materials, slantite, for example, where you have a zero emission in housing until Natufos A, which is an enzyme in the, in the um, animal nutrition industry. Our aim is to expand that net sales to 22 billion. That means every single innovation that will come out of our pipeline has to have a sustainability claim in future. Why do we do this? When we looked at the number of growth of these products, they are growing much faster than products of our former portfolio. And why is that? Because there's simply innovation towards societal needs. So one thing that we have to look at as industry, we have to focus on innovation towards societal needs. Now here comes a study that we did with customers around the world. And this is also unprecedented because what you literally see from consumer goods, transportation, packaging to construction, looking at the annual reports of our customers, and many of them are yours indirectly or directly as well. They are planning to increase their recycling target from today 0 to 20% up to 50 to 75% by 2030. You know, 2030 is now. It has a huge impact on product development and asset structures. And I'm not quite sure how aware our customers are that we still have some limitations in the system to get there. Let me talk about the chances and the limits. And here's the chance. As the chemical industry, we are one of the few industries that know on a molecular basis how not only to do products, but also to unfold products. What you see here is our chemical recycling process based on pyrolysis oil that we did together with partnerships. The future of recycling will be a story of value chain partnerships across the entire cycle from producing purified oil, putting it back into the cracker, up to the disposal. And here comes the limitation of this whole cycle. While we all talk about recycling, what is missing globally is a structured process of collecting waste and allocating it to the industry. Also here, collaboration with politicians and governments will be of utmost importance. Otherwise, our customers' targets on recycling will never happen. And this is what I mean with a disconnect between wishes, dreams, and action and reality. So I'm very confident that the chemical industry is the solution provider in that angle, and we need to position ourselves as such. Now let me come to my last inspirational topic here, and this is going far beyond what we are used to. Six years ago, a team in BASF looked into what does this all mean? What does this mean if we are at a transformational change towards a society where at the center core resource usage will be the yardstick? So how do we demonstrate that we can create value if we are just measured by profit? Now, behind that thinking was the following concept. While today the world is still steered for shareholder value, and let me be clear, I'm not against it at all. But the p &L we use today, the T accounts, have been invented in 1500 by an Italian monk, Luca Pacioli, friend of Leonardo da Vinci. He was the first one coming up with the T accounts that we still use today, maybe in a little bit professionalized form. 
But during 1500, there was no climate change and there was no digitalization. So when we looked at this, we thought about, do we not have to start enriching our view on value creation, specifically for our industry? Because Michael Porter already talked about shared value, the value created in partnerships between business, environment, and society. So what we see as a future vision for our industry is, we are living in a world where the environment is limited and becomes increasingly the framework we have to operate in. Society is the target which we are doing it for, and business just part of the solution. So if this is the future value equation for a resource-centered society, then the question is, how do we measure success? And here comes an example where we started to, for the first time, do a new PNL for our industry, and at least for BASF. Own operation is BASF numbers. Um, left side, you see 70,000 suppliers. It's again about cooperation. On the right hand side, all our customers. The orange bars is the classical PNL view, the net income we generate, 60 billion euro across the value chain and economic profit. Interestingly, social value we never talked about. And this is why our industry is never honored for you know, producing so much labor around the world and stabilizing whole social systems. When you calculate that value in terms of the salaries we give to people and translate that into purchasing parity, turns out we, for example, as a value chain, generate 70 billion euro of social value that we never got rewarded for by the financial market or nobody knows about that. Why is this 70 billion euro? You know, in the PNL, humans today are a cost factor because we give salary to them. But in reality, I guess some of you might get salaries too, you go purchasing in some of the malls here in Dubai or somewhere else. By doing so, we create market. And this is what market um, purchasing parity is all about. So the PNL mentally in companies stop with a cost factor, but they do not include the purchasing power. And by the way, robots don't go shopping. So in a digital world, how can we come to a vision where robots and humans work together if humans have no value? And last but not least, we also looked at the entire environmental footprint of BSF. By the way, we have a footprint. The fact that there is no number or bar is simply a size problem because there are 70,000 companies against one. So we have a footprint, don't worry. But what is interesting, we have now 8 million data on the connection of greenhouse gas, air emissions, sea level, and all these topics, how they are interlinked. So what do we do with this? For example, when we look at investment decisions, this method for the first time enables us to look differently in investment decision. This was about a catalyst plant and a question where to put it. When we calculated the economic benefit, it was almost the same whether we put it in Poland or China. Interestingly, the social value we would create in Poland was much higher because the wages are higher. While the environmental cost in China was worse because we, it was a water-stressed area. So with this, for the first time, we got a true picture on what, potentially, value would we create economically, socially, and environmentally. And while we still have to make our investment decisions market-based, transparency increases trust and performance. So for the first time in BSF, we can now generate such a picture where we know exactly where do we generate profits in terms of wages, social value that is of utmost importance for governments and social systems, and, on, and it's for, important for us to build trust to population, and second, where do we create cost for whole society in terms of greenhouse gas and land use? And by having project-based decision-making, over time we have for the first time the ability to improve this value. Now, I know this is a very new methodology. We are just one out of 1,000 companies worldwide that are looking into such methods. 1,000 companies across various industries. And I came here today to also speak out an invitation. Because you know what? This meeting today is about collaboration, how we work together. And our industry is challenged increasingly by our contribution to sustainability. 
We have found that these first companies in the gray box are the ones that have methodologies and we asked them, would you be willing to put this into an alliance where we share our methods and IP, plus we donate all the data we have. The big four audit companies are part of this alliance. The political sponsor is the OECD, and we are collaborating with Harvard University, Oxford, and several major institutions, the EU Commission, World Economic Forum, but also BlackRock as a financial advisor, several banks, integrated reporting. The gift we would like to give to the industry as outcome of this alliance, we would like to donate 50 million data on the connection of greenhouse gas and social value. And we are currently trying to develop this methodology as a standard that we can use it for the industry. And we would like to donate this methodology so that others can try it as well to improve footprint. And this brings me to the end of my speech. I think Maybe it's a vision going forward, but I think you in the Middle East region are perfectly um, positioned you know, to also have a major stake in this. And this is why I came today also to express an invitation, because I think in the end, we as an industry have to define how standard reporting should look like in future, while governments are currently trying to design that for us. So, Having said that, if you ask me what future value creation is all about, it's about joint partnerships to create true value for environment, society, and business. And with that, I would like to thank wholeheartedly Yusuf Albanyan, the um, CEO of SABIC, for the invitation, but also Abdul Wahab Al-Sadun. Thank you very much for the kind invitation, and thanks for having me here. Thank you.